Uh, if I could just please have your attention, thank you. So uh, what I propose to do today is uh, I, I want to uh, continue with my uh, overview of uh, the history of the Indian uh, population here, Indian groups, uh, and take the narrative really up to the present. Um, you know, we are pre proceeding essentially in two ways. We're doing a chronological narrative, but we're also going to be interrupting that uh, to look at some thematic concerns. So there are some elements of the narrative that you're going to be hearing about today, which we'll return to uh, later on. So for example, you know, when we look at the 1920s, uh, there is this reading that you have from Vivek Bald, which looks at Indians who uh, moved into places like Harlem. Uh, and essentially, uh, this kind of history is something that we need to look at in greater detail, because we've had um, I would say up till the present moment, we've had very little understanding uh, of this kind of narrative. So there are essentially two narratives. One is an official narrative. And when I give you the history of the Indian diaspora here, in part I'm giving you the official narrative. So the official narrative includes such things as various immigration acts, uh, what were the consequences of these immigration acts, what were the consequence, consequences of the legal cases, uh, then there is what you might describe as an unofficial history. And that unofficial history is groups and people that have not been documented, whose histories have not really been documented, whose presence was largely uh, unknown. Right? And these are the kinds of groups, these are the kinds of people that Vivek Bal talks about and the reading that you have uh, from him, but that's in week six. So, so, so keep in mind that we're going to be moving back and forth between the readings for week five and week six, going into week seven. And the sooner you can get done with all of these readings, the better it is, because you'll have a slightly greater familiarity with some of the material. Um, and I'm going to do what I have generally done in, in most of my lectures, which is, which is begin with, with some comments that I had made towards the end of my previous lecture on Thursday, uh, where I described to you two court cases. Uh, we discussed one of them in slightly greater detail, that is the Bhagat Singh Tint case, uh, and this was preceded by the uh, Ozawa case, which is the case that came to the Supreme Court uh, in 1922, right? And in this particular case, you might recall, uh, this concerned the Japanese, and, and in this particular case, the court really came to the conclusion that the word white and the word Caucasian really are synonymous, and though Ozawa may look white, the Japanese can by no means be considered Caucasian. Right? So even though this was a blow to Ozawa and the Japanese community, the Indians took it as a matter of celebration. And the, the reason they took it as a matter of celebration was because of the court's pronouncement that the words white and Caucasian were largely synonymous. Right? And to understand that, you have to go back to that history which I had outlined for you very briefly uh, when I had spoken about the, about the, you know, the origins of what are called Indo-European languages in the late 18th century, uh, and who exactly is it, is, is it that we uh, are thinking about when we speak of a Caucasian, right? Because that word was also considered to be somewhat synonymous with the word Aryan, right? Now, in 1923, uh, this uh, pleasure, if I may put it this way, that Indians have is relatively short-lived, because in the Bhagat Singh Tint case, the court comes to the conclusion that even though Indians are certainly to be viewed as Caucasian, that it would be a stretch. It would beggar the imagination to suppose that when the founding fathers decided that they would restrict citizenship right, to free white persons, remember the law of 1790, Right? This is, again, before the mid-19th century when, when eventually people of African descent will also be entitled to citizenship. But we're going back to the late 18th century when the founding fathers essentially decided that, that American citizens could only be people who were free white persons. So now the court is saying that it really stretches the imagination to suppose that Indians would have been viewed as white by the founding fathers. It's very unlikely because there is a common sense view and this common sense view is that Indians may be Caucasian, but they certainly cannot be viewed as white. Right? So in effect, what the court is doing is it's now contradicting the position that it had taken in 1922, right? 
And that position was to reaffirm that those terms white and Caucasian are synonymous. What year was that? The, the Ozawa case is 1922. The Bhagat Singh case is, Bhagat Singh Pind case is 1923. Right? All right. Now, the effect of this Tin case is to, in fact, reinforce the legal obstructions that were already beginning to be put in place. And these go back, as I pointed out to you in my previous lectures, in 1917, the Immigration Act over there, the whole idea of the Asian Exclusion Act, you know, the, the idea that if you came from a certain region of the world, and they defined the latitudes, okay, they defined the geographic parameters, that this was what was called the Pacific Barred Zone, that in effect you could no longer migrate to the United States. And what the Tin case does is to reaffirm essentially that piece of legislation, but it has another consequence. What it does is it leads to the denaturalization of Indians who are already living here. Not all of them. And of course many of them are going to resist that. Right, so if you look at, if you look at you know, the sh my, my own history, um, which you've been reading, uh, I point out that the consequence of the Tin case is to render Indian stateless, effectively. Right? And in fact, the periodical nation, which is still published down to the present day, it's, it's, it, you know, it's one of these progressive journals that has had a long history, well extending well over 100 years. Um, it pointed out in an opinion editorial piece that it is unthinkable that the law can be used retroactively, but that is precisely what the Justice Department proceeded to do, namely to strip Indians who were already living here, right, of their status quo as citizens. Right? But, but again, the very idea of citizenship I'm saying to you at this point is now being, is, is quite uncertain. It's quite uncertain exactly what really is being entailed by this, and we do know that that the census of 1910 had actually devised six categories of US citizens. So it was white, Negro, American Indian, Japanese, Chinese, and other. Right? So at that point, the other would have included Indians, Koreans, Hispanics, so forth and so on. Right? This was a these were the six categories of citizenship that were devised in the census of 1910. And what we're saying is that things are now in enormous flux because because the Indians here, it's not simply that Indians are going to be barred from coming to the United States, that there's going to be an attempt to actually strip those who are already here of their citizenship. And then, of course, there are going to be a number of court cases, uh, some of which I described very, very briefly in my work here. Now, we don't really want to look into this in any greater detail, because that would mean really looking at some of the court cases that come up in the 30s and 40s, and that's an entire subject unto itself, right? Because what we're trying to do is give you a general sense of what is the position of Indians now. So we're saying that from 1924 onwards, Indians are effectively not going to be able to enter the US. Some of them are going to be returning to India, right? And there are going to be other kinds of consequences, some of which I want to explore. Now, what about the, what about the people who are stay, who, who, the Indians who are already staying here? And we know that there, there are some people who have returned, some who are being, being stripped of their citizenship. That's a relatively small number, the number who are going to be stripped of their citizenship, and that's because of the court cases that are going to now follow in the wake of tent. Right? So we are talking about a few thousand Indians. The 1940 census, for example, records 1,476 Indians living in the state of California, which is a very sharp decline from the estimated number of 8,000 Indians who were living in California around 1914, nine years before the Tint case. So we can see that the Indian population in the state of California, which is where the population would predominantly have been present, Right? You wouldn't have found too many Indians at this point in the East Coast. Yes, you would have found some, the kinds of Indians that Vivek Bald has talked about and some others. Um, and certainly you would not have found any in the Midwest, uh, you know, again, except maybe for a few scattered people here and there. Right? So, so if the California population registers a decline, what we're saying is effectively there's been a sharp decline of the population of Indians throughout the U.S., right? effectively. All right? Now, there are other interesting pieces of legislation. Uh, and if you look at page 40, I'm just giving you the citation so that you can read up on it you know, at that point, page 40 of my, of my book. Um, I talk about 
uh, the, the decision taken to strike down certain features of the Cable Act. What was the Cable Act, which was, which was uh, uh, sorry, uh, the Cable Act strikes down certain features of the Immigration Act of 1907. And what did the Immigration Act of 1907 do? Uh, uh, the, one of the stipulations of this Act of 1907 was that American women, women who were American citizens, if they married aliens, they would lose their citizenship. Extraordinary, right? They would lose their citizenship, and they could only regain their citizenship if their husbands became naturalized U.S. citizens. Right? This is, this is one of the stipulations of the Immigration Act of 1907. Now, of course, this was seen as highly onerous and offensive, and there was, there was an attempt made to overturn this act, and indeed, in 1922, the Cable Act will overturn this particular provision, but when it overturns this particular provision, it still makes an exception. So it says that um, uh, women who are American citizens, right, if they marry Asian males, if they marry Asian males, then, that, then they are still stripped of their citizenship. Right? In other words, if, if they happen to marry, let's put it in a generic terms now, if they marry a male who is ineligible for American citizenship, then the provisions of the Act of 1907 still remain. They do not get overturned. Right? So, if, so, so if, you know, for our purposes, what we're saying is that if an Ameri a woman who is an American citizen marries an Indian male, right, she loses her citizenship as well. Right? She would not lose her citizenship if she married, for example, a French male, because a French ma male is entitled to citizenship if he should choose to get that citizenship. If he can be naturalized as a US citizen, then she's not going to be stripped. But if she marries a male who's ineligible for citizenship, right, then she loses her citizenship too. And you might say, well, what is the relevance of this? The relevance of this, of course, is that, that after 1923, 1924, when now Indians are no longer coming here, some Indians are going back, you still have a hugely disproportionate number of males in comparison to females among the Indians. Right? So who are these Indian males going to marry? Who are they going to marry? Because women, Indians cannot any longer come into the US. There are very few women. If they marry a white woman, let's say, let's say an Indian male falls in love with a white woman, and she is an American citizenship, well, she would, be un she would be undertaking a rather hazardous act because she would lose her own American citizenship. Right? And so one constituency that is going to be available, right? and the word available might sound strange because it sounds like a marriage market, but that's what it is. We're talking about a marriage market, which is very often what it is in life. There's a marriage market. Right? And then we have to figure out how, what are the mechanics of this market. So one constituency that is available is Hispanic women. And thus you're going to get what are called Punjabi Mexican Americans. There's a, there's a colleague of mine at UC Irvine who teaches in the anthropology department, Karen Leonard, and she's written a whole book. It's called Punjabi Mexican Americans. Right? And this is a community that she looks at. Right? And so she looks at the history of this community, you know, what were some of the problems that arose Remember that both of these groups are subaltern groups in relation to the dominant group. That is that they are, they are ex existing in a relationship which is one of the dominant to the dominated. Right? They are part of the margin, marginal subaltern population. Right? Whatever their relationship to each other. Right? But certainly in relation to the dominant white group, these are marginal groups. And so you're going to get a number of these number of these marriages, uh, and you will get names like Jane Singh, for example. Okay, because now, of course, the Mexican women were almost entirely Catholic. Uh, the Indian men were largely Sikhs and Hindus. Right? You would have found very, very few Christians there. And so this is going to be one of the other issues that's, that's, going, to be, that's going to come up, and she sort of uh, has a description of what was the outcome of many of these marriages, uh, the figure she gives is that about one third of all of these marriages uh, ended up in divorce, which by today's standards doesn't sound particularly uh, like a large number, but certainly by the standards of the 1920s and 30s, that was a higher divorce rate 
than the divorce rate that you would have found, let's say, uh, in the white community, right? If, you know, white with white marriages or black with black marriages. It would have been higher rate at that point in time. So she says that about one third of these marriages ended up in, in, in divorce and she talks about, you know, some of this is oral history. She's actually talked to people who come from these communities. She looked at some court cases, uh, looked at divorce petitions, for example, right? Uh, and very frequently the complaint that the women gave was that, that the Punjabi men that they married, uh, many of them were too addicted to alcohol, right? Uh, they, they, they were not responsible husbands. Uh, th the complaint of the men is that these women are derelict in the performance of their domestic duties, that they don't, they don't perform their domestic duties as they should be, right? Uh, and they don't prepare the food properly, right? so forth and so on. You, know, you, you, get, you get these kinds of complaints. Uh, there are also a whole series of commentators who find out that in some ways it's fortuitous, right? That it was Mexican women and Indian men marrying each other, because the argument here is that, that, that certainly if you look at Christianity as a whole, Catholicism is closer to Hinduism than Protestantism would be. Right? Protestantism is a bit austere, you don't, get, you, know, you don't get the saints and so forth and so on that you, get in Christ, that you get in Catholicism. Catholicism has a bit more idolatry, shall we say, let's put it in those terms. Right? Um, it's more colorful. Okay? Then, than Protestantism. And therefore, there was something that, that the Catholics and the Hindus could have in common. Right? This is one strand of arguments that, that is very often encountered. Right? And if, again, if you, read, if you read the book, you'll notice that you know, I have a little, just a very, very short commentary on that, you know, because there have been a number of writers who have tried to point out the, the historical links between Mexico and India. I think that that's frankly quite a, quite a stretch. We don't really need to go that far back to try to understand what is happening in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s uh, in these marriages between Mexican women and um, uh, Indian men. Okay? But this is the origins of that community which is called Punjabi Mexican Americans. Now, what are the general features? Okay, so I've described one set of characteristics of this period. What is a period we're looking at? 1924 uh, to 1965. We can break it up to, from 1924 to, let's say, approximately 1945. That's the end of uh, the Second World War. And then 1945, right, to 1965, which is when uh, you're going to find the Immigration Naturalization Act uh, uh, passed. Uh, uh, the act which in effect is the law of the land even today, you know, with certain modifications, right? That the immigration system that you have really goes back to, at present, goes back to 1965. So this is the period we're looking at. And one of the features I've, that I've described to you of this period is the fact that there is a kind of a, a, a new ethnic community here uh, which arises as a consequence of the intermingling of um, uh, Hispanic women, Mexican women, um, and Indian men, Punjabis largely, and, and Hindus and Sikhs. All right, this is one consequence. The second, con second, character, second principal feature is this is a community that is, going to be, that is going to be mired in poverty. Now, this is hard for many Indians to accept, given the affluence of the Indian community today, given, given what they know of their own history. Right, the general assumption being that the Indians, you know, uh, disproportionately tend to be professionals, have high rates of education, so forth and so on. But this is an indisputable fact. There's plenty of evidence that, the, that in this period from 1924 to 1965 in particular, um, the Indians here are largely going to be living in poverty. Now, they're going to have to find various ways to negotiate the political landscape because it's effectively a new political landscape. It's a new political landscape for the reasons that we have seen, right? The, the passage of the Immigration Act, the court cases, the Asian Exclusion Act, the difficulty of owning land. In California, you couldn't own land if you were an Indian, if you were an Asian more broadly. Now, if you, if you, if you did belong to the farming community, as many of these Indians did, because recall that the Ghadar movement is pretty much over, right? It's very short-lived, second decade of the 20th century. And then you have these Ghadar conspiracy trial in San Francisco. 
And of course, you've got a smattering of students coming. Even that is going to dry up completely after 1924. The Indians are still, Indian students are still go going to be going to Britain. So in this period, 1924 to 1965, you, if you were an Indian and you were already a farmer and you owned land, but, but you could no longer own land because of the passage of legislation which made it impossible to do that, what would you do? You'd have to, you'd have to come up with some, some kind of solution. And one solution was you set up a dummy partnership with a white American who was friendly to you. So this is so so you, you would set up a partnership with a person who was an American citizen who was entitled to own land, but you are effectively running that farm. Right? This was one solution. One solution was to was to pass down the farm to people in the family who were still able to hold on to their citizenship. Because remember, as I pointed out to you, there's some people who are going to be stripped of their citizenship, but that's a relatively small number. So there are a number of these kinds of contrivances which the Indians are going to come up with to try to handle the situation at this point in time. But if you look at the figures that we have from Central Valley, okay, you know, if you look at, if you look at the areas where you've got Indian farming populations, it is very clear that a substantial number of Indians were living in poverty. At that point in time in the 1930s, as I point out in the book, in the 1930s, the census figures suggest very clearly that the Indians were the least educated of all the ethnic groups, immigrant ethnic groups, the least educated. Okay, And I'm not going to repeat the data that I have in my work because you can look at it and you can look at the various other references that I've given. So, But that's the second general characteristic that we're talking about. Now a third important development in this period. And to understand that we have to go to India for a moment here. In the 1920s, Mohandas Gandhi has emerged as the principal leader of the Indian National Congress. Right? The Indian National Congress was the, was the organization that led India to independence. There are other political formations, other political movements and organizations. But I think that you know, the standard historical narrative is that it was the, the Congress, which was the principal nationalist organization, and which is the organization that waged a struggle to evict the British from India. Now, in the 1920s, this organization is led by Mohandas Gandhi. And Mohandas Gandhi is not like any other Indian leader that we know of, and partly isn't because he had devised a whole strategy which was to liberate India through what he called mass nonviolent struggle. Right? And he has a term for this, Satyagraha, which 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 means literally the force of truth. And this is what he calls his his theory, his idea of nonviolent resistance. Satyagraha, the force of truth. Okay, that I'm going to confront my enemy with the force of truth. Now, why this has a bearing for our narrative is that Gandhi's name began to acquire a certain kind of cultural capital already in the 1920s. This is a cultural capital that Indians are still availing of a hundred years later. And when I say cultural capital, what do I mean? What I mean by that is that Gandhi's name is calculated to earn goodwill for India. Right? I mean, if, 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 if the inheritance of India had been somebody like Hitler, well, let's take the extreme opposite here. Well, it's not... You know, the mention of Hitler is not calculated to earn a person promoting his, his views goodwill. It's going to earn you the opprobrium. It's going to earn you censorship. Right? Now, Gandhi, of course, is a person who has a reputation, and we are not here going to try to assess his reputation as a, somebody who is a saintly figure, somebody who tries to introduce certain kinds of ethical considerations into how we should conduct ourselves in public life. And what should be the nature of political action? That this should be regulated, modulated by a certain set of ethical concerns. And what is certainly very clear is that by the 1920s, Gandhi is beginning to acquire a substantial following 
in the United States. Right? To the extent that we even have an American preacher by the name of John Haynes Holmes, who is a pastor of a church in New York, right? and then he gives this, gives this lecture one day. I think it's sometime around 1922. Right? And this lecture is, who is the greatest living person in the world today? So when he poses this question for, for his you know, constituency, for his flock at the church, I, I mean, everybody thinks that, well, he's probably going to mention somebody like, you know, Lenin. You know, this is before Lenin had fallen into disfavor. You know, now, of course, nobody would think of, you know, mentioning Lenin, right? But at but that time, Lenin was a great hero of the Bolshevik Revolution, right? Others thought that, well, maybe Holmes is going to mention Woodrow Wilson, right? So forth and so on. You know, a number of candidates came to mind. Well, Holmes goes on to describe this little brown man, as he says, living in this part of India, and he says that he's the greatest man in the world today. Right? This is an illustration of the fact that Gandhi's name was beginning to circulate in India. And of course, what the Indian community is going to try to do is it's going to try to capitalize on his name. Now, it's, you know, merely invoking Gandhi's name is not going to earn Indian citizenship. Of course not. We have to be very clear about that. I'm not talking about that kind of cultural capital. But what I'm saying is that one of the things that Indians are going to be doing, beginning in the late 1920s, moving into the 30s and then the 40s, right, before eventually the advent of independence in 1947, is to be trying to lobby Americans to support India's struggle for independence. And it's easier to lobby, from their point of view, Americans to support India's struggle for independence because in India itself, the struggle is being led by somebody who's considered to be a heroic, saintly figure. Right? And this is what I mean when I say that Gandhi's name is cultural capital. Right? And, and if you continue this story down to the present day, I mean, why is it that, for example, you know, there are over 30 American cities today that have statues of Mohandas Gandhi? I mean, Los Angeles doesn't have one. You'd have to go to Riverside to see the closest one uh, of Gandhi in, in Southern California. But if you go to New York, you go to Houston, Chicago, there's a statue of Mohandas Gandhi. I mean, as far as I'm aware, there's no other 20th century figure, foreign 20th century figure, of whom there are more statues than there are of Gandhi in the United States. Okay? To the extent that you can find a statue of him now in Washington, D.C., where placing a statue is not an easy thing because, because monuments in Washington, D.C., what monuments can be placed there? All of this is strictly governed by a commission which decides who can be placed there, which is why if you had to put up a statue of Martin Luther King, I mean, it took many years. The commission sits down, you know, you know uh, essentially asks the citizens, tries to get a sense of what support there would be throughout the country. But the Indian embassy was lobbying along with various other Americans for, for well over two decades to have a statue of Gandhi installed in Washington, D.C. Okay, and these are, these are the ways in which obviously the diasporic population exercises some kind of degree of influence. And this is what I mean when I say that Gandhi's name has cultural capital. One reason why you want to put up his statue is because, of course, uh, Indians can always point to somebody like Gandhi and say that, well, you know, we, we both come from the same country. You know, we're fellow Gujaratis or whatever the argument might be. So this goes back now to the 1920s, 1930s, into the 1940s. And in the 1930s, now we can also write this story independently of Gandhi to some degree. We cannot do it entirely because there are people like Haridas Mazumdar. Now who is Haridas Mazumdar? Haridas Mazumdar is an Indian who's living here. He's an intellectual. He's a, uh, somebody who wants to promote... Uh, you know, knowledge in America of, of Gandhi's struggle in India. Uh, he's going to write a dozen books. And, 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 and these books are coming out from major publishers, you know, from Harper and Row. These books are coming out from major publishers. They're getting fairly wide publicity. And this is one of the ways, obviously, in which, in which Gandhi's message was being circulated throughout this country. That there is another part of that story which I can only mention in passing simply so that you are aware of it. We can't look into it in any greater detail. And that is that Gandhi is going to begin to have 
In the 1930s, a very substantial following among African Americans. Okay, most people think that this really goes, that, you know, you, you can only really think of Martin Luther King and, you know, who, who's whose indebtedness to Gandhi, of course, has been the subject of scores of books and articles and is well known. And Martin Luther King himself, actually, when he went to India, he said that when I go to any other country in the world, I go there as a tourist, but when I come to India, I go as a pilgrim. And, that, and that's because the idea that India was the land that had generated the whole idea of nonviolent, mass nonviolent struggle and resistance, uh, an idea pioneered by Gandhi, this is something that, that, that King felt deeply indebted to. But this history, this narrative goes back to a period before the birth of Martin Luther King. It goes back to the 1920s. 1922, a journal called Crisis, published by the great African American intellectual W.E.B. Du Bois, carries an article as early as 1922. Right? And this article is an article describing Gandhi's struggle in India. And the question comes up, when will the African American community produce a Gandhi? Will there be a black Gandhi? Right? That's, that's the, that's, I'm putting it to you in a nutshell. This is going to be the constant refrain. And so in the 1930s, you're even going to get a, a delegation that is going to go from among a group of African American intellectuals. Some of them associated with Morehouse College, which is where Martin Luther King is eventually going to get educated. The president of Morehouse, a number of other people, they're all going to go to India in 1936 because they want to have a meeting with Gandhi and try to understand what is it that he's done in India, which might be useful for them as they think about how they're going to wage a civil rights movement in the United States. All right, so you see that these are the connections you'd have to think of. Now, if you did that official history, that official history would be, well, okay, from 1924 to 1945, it's basically a desert. There's nothing there. And most traditional histories of the Indian diaspora until fairly recently did exactly that, that this was a period which was a period which was blanked out. It's blanked out because nobody's coming, no Indian is coming to the U.S. The few that remain, right, are largely living in poverty, or a good number of them are. Some of them have married Mexican women, right? The community is not producing any figure that anybody would want to know anything about. That was a traditional narrative. And what we're saying is that, in fact, the period is actually quite rich in very different ways, because the fact that you have this Punjabi Mexican American community, well, this itself is worthy of exploration, right? How, how does one describe them as part of the larger Indian diaspora? Okay, and if, if you have their offspring and somebody, you know, who is a child of this marriage marries an African American, well, is, what, what is the identity of that person? So forth and so on. And then we are saying that the 1920s, 30s, first half of the 1940s are important because there is going to be a concerted attempt to lobby for Indian independence in the United States. And we're not evaluating whether these attempts at lobbying were, were extraordinarily successful or not. I mean, my own conclusion would be that they were not. That, that fundamentally, the achievement of Indian independence is something that has to be attributed to the struggle that was waging in India itself. But nonetheless, there's going to be an attempt made here to some degree. And then, of course, there's the particular manner in which Gandhi's name becomes a form of cultural capital, a history that, as I've suggested, continues down to the present day. Right? And there are a number of other figures as well who are, who are interesting. I mentioned some of them. Tarkanath Das, who's, again, an intellectual, uh, you know, quasi-revolutionary. Uh, he's going to try, he's going to play some role in the intellectual life of the Indian American community. Uh, then there's Dan Gopal Mukherjee, whose work has recently been revived. There's a new edition of one of his books that has come out, Cast and Outcast. Uh, and he's one of the first Indians who's going to make an attempt to try to explain uh, the functioning of Indian society to an American audience. You know, what is the nature of the caste system? Right? Because, you, because again, you have to go back to this period and and try to understand what is it that was really known about India to most Americans. And it would be very, very little. Right? So this is essentially the, peri the, the history that takes us to 45. Now, why is that, a, uh, why is that something you know, of a watershed 
I don't think it's frankly much of a watershed. It, it's a it's a it's a it's a real watershed only if you think that, yeah, you know the the the, the war ended in 1945, uh, and therefore people could turn their attention to other kinds of considerations, uh, and we do know that from 1945 to 1965, uh, owing to some modifications in American legislation, Indians are going to be permitted in very small numbers to enter the United States. 100 per year. That was a quota after 1945. 100 Indians were going to be permitted to enter the U.S. until the passage of the Immigration Act in 1965. Did you have a question? Can you just repeat that question again? I didn't get all of it. Did this have to do with like our support of Indian independence? Oh, you mean you mean you mean the the change in 1945? Yeah. Well, the change in 1945 came about for a number of reasons. One was the fact that people like Roosevelt, right, had issued ringing declarations that this is a war not just for the liberation of Germany from Nazi rule uh, and ridding you know, the world of the menace of Japanese aggression, but it was a war intended to provide emancipation to everybody. Well, if you're going to provide emancipation to everybody and you have decided to block out entire groups of people from your own country, well, there's a bit of a contradiction there. I mean, how, how, how can you really you know, possibly expect people to believe that the United States is a beacon of freedom and democracy and so forth and so on, um, if you adopt an overtly racist stance saying that, well, if you happen to be Asiatic, you're simply going to be excluded from the United States. And so there were ideological reasons as well. But it would be difficult to argue that there were groups in India that could have lobbied the U.S. to make its presence felt. Right? But India is, of course, on the verge of independence. And certainly, I think, you see, the question is an interesting question because this is where, I mean, somebody would have to dig deep into the archive and perhaps come up with some documents which might suggest that, that such things as the influence of Gandhi, the cultural capital that he carried, influenced some American lawmakers to say, well, perhaps we should relax the rules permitting Indian immigration into the United States. But let's not relax them too much. Because at the end of the day, we all recognize, according to this way of thinking, right, that the Oriental is inferior to the European, to the Occidental. So we can't have this floodgate. And of course, the whole idea was that if you, if you don't restrict it, there's going to be a floodgate. The people are just going to try to come in in huge numbers. This is why that early history is important. Remember 1907, 1908, 1909? I mean, you have a few dozen Indians, maybe a couple of hundred, and already the newspapers are saying Hindu hordes, invasion. Right? Now, they don't want to relive that whole thing again. So the idea is, well, you permit some Indians to come in, come in right? and this, of course, is going to sufficiently convey the impression that the United States has now decided that Yes, it's going to really live by the principles that it has announced to the rest of the world. So if you look at page 51, <coughs> right, so this is, there's an Immigration Act. I said 45, I use that as a benchmark. It's actually, there's an Immigration Act of 1946 uh, uh, signed into law on July 2nd by President Truman, uh, which uh, sets a quota of 100 for Indians to come in, right, and also will now permit naturalization of Indians. That is that you can actually become a U.S. citizen, right? Now, the advocates of this legislation included Claire Booth Luce. And as I argue, she supports this legislation not from any intrinsic belief in the equality of colored people and white Americans, but because failure to pass the bill would erode America's, quote, moral leadership, not only throughout the Asiatic world, but here at home among our own colored people. Right? So you can see what are the considerations that are important for somebody like her who's, who's right, supporting this legislation eventually that will allow 100 Indians to come into the US. And Mrs. Luce described herself as the first to protest against people of any nation, of any color, coming here in such numbers as to lower our living standards and weaken our culture. 
Right? So this is the other side of it, that you don't want them in com coming in such large numbers because if they do, that's going to erode the moral fiber of American society. Right? Because, because these people, they don't have the moral standards that we have. Right? This is a principle, and I'm quoting from her, on which we are all agreed. I love this, on which we are all agreed, the royal we, because the only people whose agreement counts is, of course, the dominant community. And no sane white American would think that these people embody the same ethical standards and moral standards that we do. We are all agreed on this. Right? But on the other hand, we do have to show some element of generosity because America's moral leadership will be in question if we decide to shut out entire groups of people. Right? That's what's happening essentially in 1946. Yes? Following the Indian independence in 1947, yes. the Indian government actively lobbied for a more lax immigration policy? I cannot give you an answer to that because I don't know what the archival record is on that. Let me put it to you this way. At least in the literature that's available that I've seen, there's nothing to suggest that the Indian government, government played you know, any kind of substantial role. I mean, there might have been occasional mention here and there, but not that I'm aware of. One reason why the Indian government would most likely not have done that is because India didn't really have, as it were, the power to be heard. I mean, Yes, you acquire independence in 1947, but it comes with a bloodbath, right? A huge bloodbath because of the creation of Pakistan, the partition, the killings that took place, and huge segments of the country are sunk in poverty. I mean, so India is not really going to be able to make itself heard that forcefully. But there's also constituencies there, because remember what, what the other big development in the aftermath of the end of World War II. There's a new Cold War that starts immediately. Right? Where the world is essentially divided into two factions, you know, the Soviet camp and, or the Soviet bloc and the U.S. bloc. India is going to adopt a policy of non-alignment. Right? India is going to adopt officially a policy of non-alignment. And so if India officially adopts a policy of non-alignment, I don't think the Indian government would have been very keen on propositioning the American government to relax the rules. Right? As I said, that obviously there would have been some feeling of hurt sentiments, unquestionably. There are probably people who are deeply offended that, well, a hundred people are being allowed. How generous is that, right? Maybe not, nobody should be allowed. That might be better. Because at least that puts the racism out there front, frontly on the table. Right? So I, I think the Indian government would certainly have had a very ambivalent attitude towards that. But your question is a very good one, except that I really am not in a position to answer it because I don't know what the archival material, if there is archival material on this, says about it. All right, so, so this is the position till now, 1945, 46. And then we get the last phase before the 1965 Act. Uh, and, and this is a phase which, about which, in fact, actually you could say in some respects we know less than we do. Because now there are obviously Indians coming in. The bulk of them are going to be people who are going to be graduate students. Right? Graduate students, maybe some professional, because it's restricted to 100 people. And you would have had to be a person of substantial means to be able to come to the United States in this period of time. Did you have a question? So, yes, so it was still restricted to 100 people. 100. 100 Indians per year. Yeah. I mean, you know, give or take, they may be, they, they might have, you know, if you, were, if you were, let's say, an artist of eminence and you wanted to emigrate, you know, to the United States, uh, right, and the quota of 100 had already been exhausted, I'm sure that they made an exception. You know, but, we're, but, but that's the general number that's stipulated by law is 100, okay? Between this period, 1945 to 1965, right? And then, and, 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 and it would not be possible to really speak about the consolidation of a community at this point in time because the numbers are still very, very small, moving all the way into the 1960s. Right? And one of the things that's happened, of course, during this period of time is that now, you know, India itself is a free country, right? So, for example, the kind of cultural capital that Gandhi's name carried. Well, of course, it still continues, but it's much less potent at this point in time. It's much less potent because on the one hand, Gandhi, who's going to be assassinated in January 1948, you know, he's no longer in the picture, right? And, you know, there, is, there, are, no there are no attempts being made now to lobby, 
for Indian independence because that's already an objective that has been achieved. On the other hand, the numbers of Indians are so small at this point in time that they do not really constitute a political constituency. Right? They just don't. But we are going to get an, we are going to get the first Indian elected, you know, in, in this period of time in the fifties. Okay, the first Indian ever elected to the U.S. Congress, and many people have wondered how that was possible. So his name is the Leap Singh South. He's a mathematician. Right? Not a very likely candidate for somebody to be elected to the U.S. Congress from California. Right? He's going to get elected to the House of Representatives, and if I remember correctly, I think he, you know, he served. He served, I think, six years uh, in the House. Okay. So how does he get elected? Well, one of the reasons it's it's easier for him to get elected at this point in time than it would have been in the 70s or 80s because and then in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, you don't have any Indian. Even though their numbers are now going to begin to go up dramatically following the passage of the 1965 Act, which is going to set a quota of 20,000. Right? That's the, you know, this, and that's 20,000 not just, by the way, for Indians. It's a, a quota of 20,000 from any country, right? So it could be 20,000 coming from Greece, 20,000 from India, from China, wherever, right? That this is the number of people who are going to be permitted to enter the United States from a country in any given year, right? So now that's a huge increase. And you might expect that, well, in the 70s or 80s, by now in the Indian community is much larger. It has some kind of political force behind it, right? But that's not the time when an Indian gets elected. I mean, my theory is that the reason it's easier for him to get elected is precisely because he is seen as being apolitical in a way, right? I mean, he's a mathematician by profession, right? He's obviously got some political interest since he's, since he's uh, opted to stand for election and to serve in, in the House, right? So when I say apolitical, I, I mean it in a different way, that he's seen as somebody who is not a threat, to any ethnic community, to either to the white group or to other ethnic Asian groups, right? And, and since he's apolitical, he's seen as somebody who in some ways is beyond and above the usual kind of, you know, negotiations and slander that goes on in the game of politics, right? But whatever the circumstances, it's very clear that, that his election is possible at this time and in my judgment, would not have been possible, for example, in the 70s or 80s. And then you're going to have to wait, you know, uh, until a few years ago uh, to have Indians enter into politics again, because now, of course, it's the other side of the story, which is that the community is, you know, present in the U.S. in very large numbers, uh, is highly educated, highly affluent, and therefore feels that it should exercise its muscle to some degree, if it can, right, make itself heard. Right, so this is a, 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 the other end of the narrative from what is happening in the 1950s. Now, rather than continuing this narrative and taking us down to the present day, what I want to do is I want to interject some elements from the segment having to do with religion. Okay? Uh, so that what, what we're going to have is we're going to now have a number of parallel narratives here. And one, one is this general chronological narrative, which, which I brought up to 1965, and I will eventually bring up to to the present day. Uh, the second is, what are the religious and cultural forms of life for Indians? Okay. And very often this narrative begins with the, coming to in, with the coming to the United States of an Indian by the name of Vivekananda, Swami Vivekananda. Uh, in fact, I would say that he has occupied a, a disproportionate place almost uh, in this narrative, but nonetheless, he's an important figure. Uh, and, and we need to try to understand what is his significance and what brought him to the United States. Right? Because with, his, with him, we're going to begin to see something like what we might describe as the organized presence of Hinduism in the U.S., even if it's not in the immediate aftermath of Vivekananda. It might take a few more decades before that begins to happen, but Vivekananda is a person who in some ways might have been the instigator of that. Right, so who is he? He's an Indian monk. He's a, he's a follower, a disciple of uh, Sri Ramakrishna, 
right? also known as Ram Krishna Paramhans. And Sri Ramakrishna is an Indian bhakta. bhakta the word bhakta means uh, devotee. Uh, so somebody who is uh, viewed as an exponent of bhakti. Bhakti is devotion. Uh, and if you look at, uh, let's say, a text such as the Bhagavad Gita, right, which is a text that goes back to approximately the second century AD. And the Bhagavad Gita describes you know, various paths to spiritual emancipation. Right? So there's a path of action, the path of works. There's a path of intellectual discrimination. Right? There's a path of devotion. Be devoted to God. Okay. Sri Ramakrishna Paramhans is an Indian uh, bhakta, a magisterial figure uh, who acquires a very substantial following. Uh, he doesn't himself, by the way, write anything. You know, whatever we know of, of his teachings, it all comes down to us from conversations that were recorded. Okay, so there's a book called The Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna by M. M is Mahindranath but it usually says M, uh, initial of the author. And he was one of his disciples who sat down with Ramakrishna Paramhansa or Sri Ramakrishna and recorded these conversations where you get insights into what Ramakrishna thinks about, as I said, you know, spiritual emancipation. How does one gain spiritual emancipation? What is the nature of the soul? How should one live in this world? Right? So forth and so on. So we are talking here about, this, about the, the second half of the 19th century. And one of his disciples is going to be Narendra Datta, who is going to be known as Vivekananda, Swami Vivekananda. And Vivekananda has become, I, I, I'm, I'm emphasizing this a bit, because just as Gandhi's name has a certain kind of cultural capital, similarly we might say, Vivekananda's name has immense cultural capital for especially young Indians and professional Indians. You know, it's, it's, there have been a number of conferences that have been held by the Indian community in the United States exploring the life and work of Swami Vivekananda. Right, because he is seen as a person who is the symbol of an energetic India and India on the verge of a renaissance, you know, arising from centuries of slumber to occupy its rightful place as a great power in the modern world. Right? That's how I would put it. That is what Vivekananda represents to young Indians, professional Indians in the diaspora in India itself. But in India, there's competition from a few other figures. Here, Vivekananda really looms very large in the Indian diasporic imagination. And that's one reason why I think we have to go back to 1893, not only because of the great stories that have come out of what happened in 1893, you know, when Vivekananda first came to the United States, okay? but because his name continues to have this extraordinary resonance among the Indian diasporic population. You know, I, I, a few years ago, I went to uh, Chicago to, I, I've been engaged in this project for some time now, looking at Hindu temples, and you're going to see a few more PowerPoints now in the, in the next few weeks, where I'm going to show you some slides uh, of Hindu temples and the religious life of the Indian community. Uh, and so I went to the greater Hindu temple of, uh, the, the Hindu temple of greater Chicago. And, and before you enter the temple premises, you know, just as you enter the compound, the property, there's this huge statue of Vivekananda. So he really looms large in every sense of the term. Now Vivekananda is, as I said, a symbol of this energetic India, a new India, a young India. We're talking about the 1880s, 1890s, right? Struggling to free itself not only from colonial rule, but but really struggling to find its place in the modern world and live up to right, its ancient self. So Vivekananda, let, let me put it to you this way, is somebody who is deeply read in Indian texts, in the, in the ancient scriptures, and at the same time wants to embody all the aspirations of people who have a modern scientific temper. So he's going to embody the classic problem 
I'm, I'm putting it to you in a real cliched form, but, it's, but you will get the hang of it immediately. Right? How do you bring together, as I said, the most cliched form, how do you bring together tradition and modernity? In this case, how do you bring together the wisdom of Indian tradition and the advancements of the modern scientific temperament? Right? And Vivekananda is going to belong to that school of thought, at least that's one dominant interpretation, is going to belong to that school of thought, which is going to argue that India is, is well positioned because India is the greatest repository of sacred literature, the greatest repository of an ancient wisdom, and Indians are in the position to be able to also command a kind of scientific temper which has antecedents in its own past and has now, of course, this, this familiarity with science and so forth has come about as partly as a consequence of colonial rule in India. So Vivekananda is going to come to the United States in 1893. What brings him here? The World Parliament of Religions, the first attempt to bring together the representatives of the world's religions for, let me use a very modern term, this term was not used back then, for what it would today be called an interfaith dialogue. Right? You know, how can the religions of the world communicate with each other? Of course, one reason why they're having this meeting in 1893, which is going to be held in Chicago, is that there are already some people who think that religion is in fact the source of the greatest conflicts in the world. And therefore, it is imperative that before these conflicts really become ferocious and out of control, that the adherents of these different religions should meet together. Okay? And this is what is going to be the World Parliament of Religions held in Chicago in 1893. Vivekananda is going to be, is going to be the sole representative of Hinduism. Right? And he's going to represent this faith and come here in 1893. And there are, by the way, all kinds of interesting stories. So one story is that when he came here uh, to the U.S., you know, he'd, be, he'd been given uh, uh, the reference uh, of the person who was going to uh, be arranging for his accommodation, you know, since he was an official delegate. Okay, but by those, by, in those days, obviously, you came by ship. Right? So when Vivekananda arrives uh, in the U.S., he loses a piece of paper where he'd written down this information. And he's found wandering around the streets of Chicago. And he gets so tired that at 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. at night he falls asleep, you know, the house of somebody. And this woman, you know, in the morning she opens her door and what does she find? She finds this man in orange robes, because that's what Vivekananda wore, orange robes. You know, these are the robes of a Hindu monk, and Hindu ascetic, right? And according to the story, she had read that, that about the World Parliament of Religions, which was about to be held in Chicago, and she had, she had read that in, uh, Hinduism was going to be represented by this Indian Swami. So she sort of puts two and two together uh, and you know, welcomes the, the Swami into you know, her home. Right? And one of the reasons why this story is told is that it is said that Vivekananda had this extraordinary charm. Okay, you know, and this has been, has developed, as I said, almost into a kind of a hagiographic literature about him. Right? Now, at this meeting in 1893, he electrifies the audience. And he electrifies the audience not by his mere presence only. Sometimes that's exotic enough. You know, you have a Hindu monk, you know, with a turban and, and, and orange robes. Uh, and, uh, you know, he speaks English well, is obviously educated, uh, seems to have extraordinary charisma, right? But he electrifies the audience because, unlike all the others who would begin their talks by saying, well, ladies and gentlemen, or so forth and so on, Vivekananda says, dear sisters and brothers of America. And then, and then he gives a speech outlining what is it that makes India unique? What does India have to contribute to you know, to the idea of world religion, to world harmony, how can Hinduism enter into a dialogue with Christianity, so forth and so on. He acquires a very substantial following. That there is no question about. I, when I was living in Chicago in the 1980s, I used to go to uh, the Ramakrishna, so Ramakrishna, right, that's, that's, the master of Vivekananda. So the Ramakrishna people, they, they have a monastery, a Ramakrishna monastery, and I used to go there once in a while, and it's in a town called, you're not going to believe this, the town is called Ganges. 
Okay, you can look it up. Which is which is the river, the sacred river, right? Sacred river in India, and it's not far from another town called Nirvana. Nirvana is a Buddhist term for enlightenment. You know, when you reach a state of complete enlightenment, you are in Nirvana, right? So you arrive in Nirvana, and then you send a postcard home saying, "I'm in Nirvana." Right? <laughs> now, why did these two towns? Why are, why do you have these two little towns called Ganges and Nirvana? Because one of Vivekananda's disciples was the governor of Michigan. And you know, when these towns, new towns were coming up, you know, at this point in time, you still have quite a few new, new towns coming up. We're talking about the 1890s moving into the early part of the 20th century. He decided to give these two towns Indian names, Ganges and Nirvana. Vivekananda has offered a professorship at Harvard University. And there are stories about about the incredible charm that he exercised among women in elite circles in Boston. So forth and so on. Okay? Yeah, but, but you see, all of these are well-recognized tropes. You know, the, you know, the oriental mystic, right? The oriental sage, and then, you know, white liberal people all falling at his feet. Right? This is a well-established trope. Now, this trope goes back to the time of Swami Vivekananda. Okay? Going back to the 1890s, moving into the early part of the 20th century. Vivekananda himself is not going to live very long. You know, after this triumphant tour, and he's going to spend time in the United States, he's going to die quite young. In a few years after this, after this trip. Right? But nonetheless, something of a presence of what we might call Hinduism has been established in the United States. And of course the only earlier presence that we can speak about is a textual presence. Right? That is, the, that is the, the, the fact that there were these Hindu texts, the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, right? which were known to a very small number of American intellectuals and, that, and that's a scenario that I've already described to you when I was describing the American transcendentalist. Uh, the role played by Emerson and Thoreau in the 1840s and 1850s uh, in creating some kind of awareness of uh, traditions of Indian uh, spirituality or Indian philosophical traditions. But to begin to understand the emergence of certain conceptions of Hinduism, certain conceptions of Hinduism, and to begin to understand the emergence of organized Hinduism in some peripheral sense of the term. I want to underscore that because you don't really get organized Hinduism until much, much later. You really have to think of the 1970s and 80s before you can think of organized Hinduism. Right? But in, in some peripheral marginal sense, we can say that Vivekananda is going to help to instigate this because when he's going to have these followers, there's going to be more interest that's going to be generated. And by the 1920s, there are going to be a few Ramakrishna Vivekananda centers in the United States. Right? And if you look at the 1930s, one of the, one of the major Indian figures who establish a, establishes a presence, he's a monk of this order. So this is the Ramakrishna Vivekananda, this becomes an order. It's a, okay? And it's, it's, you could say it's both a monastic order, but, but unlike many Indian monastic orders, it is a monastic order which believes in the idea of service. So the Ramakrishna, Vivekananda people, you know, their disciples, they tend to go out and do social work. And that's what I mean when I say the idea of service. Right? Because the traditional monastic order is you sort of retreat. Right? So this is a, the people who, who you know, decide to join this order, <coughs> they lead the life of monks. But this monastic order also has this element of service in it. Okay, so by the 1930s, uh, one of the principal Indian figures is going to be a man by the name of Swami Prabhavananda. Swami Prabhavananda, and he's an Indian intellectual uh, who is, uh, 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 besides, being a, besides being a monk of this order, uh, he's somebody who is interested in Indian scripture traditions and making them more widely available in translation. Uh, 
And he is going to enter into a collaboration with a number of British intellectuals who, we know there's a long history again of British intellectuals finding sunny California very attractive. I mean, if you've lived in England any period of time, you would know why California is attractive, you know, right? You know, so, so you, you get these English intellectuals who make their home in sunny California. And among them is Aldox Huxley, right? I mean, I'm one of the major writers of the 20th century. Remember Brave New World, for example, okay, right? So Huxley, Christopher Isherwood, I mean, these are some of the English intellectuals who decide that they're going to make their home in California. And Huxley and Isherwood, for various reasons that I can't enter into right now, and they have their own intellectual histories, they're interested in Indian texts and Indian philosophical traditions. So you're going to get these translations. For example, a translation of the Bhagavad Gita, which I still recommend, by the way, if you can find it. it used to be available for you know, almost nothing, 25 cents in bookstores all the time uh, at one point. And it's a translation of the Bhagavad Gita uh, by Swami Prabhavananda and Christopher Isherwood, and it has an introduction by Aldous Huxley. Right? So, so this is what's happening in the 1930s. You know, if you go to places like Pasadena, you can you can see the Ramakrishna Vivekananda Center, or you go even today, okay, uh, to places like, uh, for example, Pacific Palisades. Now, there you have a different group. That's a self-realization fellowship. They have a center there, and that has another interesting history, which again goes back several decades. Right, so what you're having is more, however, the intellectual side of Hinduism. And again, this is something I want to underscore, because let's be very clear. None of these people, Isherwood, Huxley, or the Americans who are going to begin to embrace such things as yoga. Right? Now, nowadays we hear a lot about yoga. And even in American public schools today, yoga is being taught in a great number of schools. But the idea of yoga starts to be acquire a following in the 1920s, early 1920s. But at that point, it is not what yoga is today, because now it's all about poses and exercises, asans, as they're called. Okay, and you know, you, then you get characters like Bikram Yoga, who has you know very rigid rules about how you undertake these asans. You know, a temperature control room, 95 degrees. You know, you have to bake your body really. Right? Stringent conditions, right? And he's tried to, of course, patent many of these asans. Right? He's, by the way, another very good example of this long line of Indian either spiritual teachers or yogis or yoga teachers who acquire a very substantial following. And as some of you might be aware that there are a number of court cases against him right now by white women who, are, who allege that, well, you know, he wasn't simply dispensing the sexual, I mean, the, the, uh, the spiritual wisdom and also the sexual wisdom of India. Right? These are some of the charges. These stories all go back, again, to certain allegations, rumors that were already beginning to circulate at this point in time. Okay, and again, we're not here assessing the merit of these allegations and stories. We're trying to understand what is the ambiance, what is the climate, what are some of the tropes, okay, sets of ideas that come into circulation. And one of the ideas that comes into circulation is the idea of yoga. But at this point in time, it's understood largely as a kind of an intellectual meditational practice. Okay, and of course it's considered to be exotic and quaint. There's no question about that. I mean, it's still considered exotic and quaint in some parts of the United States. But in the 1920s, it certainly was. Right, so, so if, you're, if we begin to look now at religion, very broadly, what am I saying? We're saying, number one, that there's a figure of Vivekananda, and Vivekananda becomes a critical figure in this narrative, not simply because of what he may have achieved. That is that the beginnings of organized Hinduism, in some peripheral sense of the term, perhaps go back to him, to his aspirations, to his endeavors in the United States to build up a community of people. Okay? But that's still very marginal. He's important also because of the fact that he remains the single most important icon for the Indian diasporic population. 
down to the present day. And we'll get a, a, even a better sense of that as we move along in this course when we move into subsequent weeks when I'm going to begin to you know, look a bit more closely at what are the ideologies of Hindu nationalism that began to percolate among Indians right, in the United States. Now at this point in time in the 1920s that's not, there is, you know, you don't really have these ideologies of extreme Hindu nationalism. What you do have is you have, as I described to you earlier, you have a number of people who are interested in, in sort of establishing lobbying groups trying to, trying to persuade Americans that they should be supporting Indian independence. Right? But that's a far cry from the kind of influence that Hindu nationalists will begin to exercise in the United States in much later decades. Okay, so this is a story essentially until the 1920s, 30s, and I've described to you another strand of it, which is, which is that this Hinduism that people are beginning to get familiar with, minuscule number of people are only familiar with it at this point. But even they are only familiar with what you might describe as more the intellectual side of Hinduism and Indian philosophical practices. This has almost nothing to do with, with everyday forms of Hinduism and Hindu rituals and Hindu worship, right? And what we might call popular forms of religiosity. There is no awareness of that at this point in time. Now, the next significant chapter, the next significant chapter in this narrative, and I'm going to just mention that very briefly and then conclude my lecture for today with that, is the emergence of what is called the Hare Krishnas in the United States in the 1960s. Okay? So remember, 1945 to 65, you've got a very, very small community of Indians. We're talking about a few thousand people. few thousand people. You don't really have any organized religious life. You only begin to have organized religious life when the, when the community gets a bit larger, and then you can have a house of worship. And initially the house of worship, and, and for Hindus we're talking about a mandir, right? For Muslims, of course, it would be a masjid, okay, or, or a mosque. So for Hindus we're talking about a mandir, and for Sikhs we're talking about a gurdwara. And there were, by the way, already uh, gurdwaras, uh, in the United States, not very many. The first Gurdwara is set up in Stockton in California. Okay. But again, the community is very small. Right. So 45 to 65, we cannot really speak of any kind of organized religious life. Insofar as there was any, it would have been in the homes of people. And somebody who does oral history would have to interview somebody who is now in their 70s, 80s, or 90s, whatever, to see what that might have been like. You know, insofar as there was any really organized religious life, because there really are no temples. And initially, the temples are all going to be makeshift temples. So very often what a community does, and it does it even today, by the way, because you may be living in a very small part of the U.S., you know, you may be living in Fargo, or you may be living in uh, North Dakota, or you may be living in some small town in Arkansas, or Alabama, right? And there the community is not large enough to be able to build a brand new Hindu temple, right? To commission architects over and so on. So what do you do? You take over a building that is no longer occupied. A, even a church. It could be a warehouse, and you convert it. That's a makeshift temple. Once the community becomes larger, then you begin to think about what would be a proper Hindu temple. Okay, so this is the history you have to keep in mind, 45 to 65, no organized religious life. Now the Hare Krishnas are going to become the public face of, of Hinduism, beginning in the mid-1960s. Very briefly, what is happening in the 60s? What is it that is going to bring, okay, Srila Prabhupada, okay, who is the, the founder of the Hare Krishnas? I will describe to you their ideology in my next lecture. Begin with that very briefly, but he's the one who is going to, in a sense, capitalize on certain, ha certain things that are happening in American society. And what's happening is in the 1960s, as I'm sure most of you are aware, a certain kind of cultural and political ferment, unrest. People want to expose themselves to something different. 
a certain tiredness with the materialism of American life, with the political stalemates. You've got a civil rights movement going on, you've got a war going on in Vietnam. Something about the religions of the Orient, let's use the stereotype, religions of the Orient is going to become attractive to Americans. Okay, in the mid 1960s. That's what you have to keep in mind. That's the template to understand who the Hare Krishnas are and how they're going to emerge. Right, so I'm going to continue with that on Thursday.